it's at Felicia Pixel, and welcome back. You have joined me and listened to me hundreds and hundreds of times as I've shared my art talks with you. And as grateful as I am, I'm not a product of myself and myself alone. I'm a product of, well, for starters, an amazing family and friends that have kept me real and encouraged me to be the best version of myself day after day, but also the product of role models and influences that I've gained and maintained over many years. And I thought today would be a wonderful day to share this with you. Before I do, however, for starters, I encourage you to stick around to the end because you might be surprised by some of the people that I mention on this short list, not exhaustive by any stretch. But secondly, I encourage you to do the same. Let us know in the comments below who have been the biggest role models and influences in your life, but most importantly, why? Because in understanding why, we will know why they've brought you such value and so much meaning in your life, and we can all benefit from that. So, who would I like to mention first? Well, I wanted to give that honor, that homage to an individual, a man who um, contributed monumental things to both the creative, the artistically creative field, which I'm predominantly a part of, I'm an artist, but also I'm a teacher and he's contributed the most to the educational system as well. He comes from the angle of education, but has been a very loud and very meaningful and very impactful voice in the world of cre the creative arts as well. Visual arts, dance, music, acting, etc. And is not shy of that himself. He's got quite a skill in all of the above himself. And that is Sir Ken Robinson, who you might know, by the way. Uh, you might not know him by name, but he's he was the individual who gave the most popular TED talk of all time, which was Do Schools Kill Creativity? An amazing listen. He was invited back years later to give another moving presentation as well. But since his passing, since he passed away, it's his daughter, Kate Robinson, who took the helm, who narrated his most recent book, which is Imagine If. But Ken, Sir Ken Robinson, before he had passed, wrote two amazing books, one of which was Creative Schools, and the second was Out of Our Minds, and two books which I've read numerous times. And they are, in a sense, my mantra when it comes to the individual that I aspire to be, but also the art teacher that I am. And it reminds me to, to, it reminds me of what is most valuable. So what is it about his personality, his books and his influence that have been so meaningful to me? Well, for starters, he has managed to transform education in so many different ways. But he's done so that does not do what most educational institutions do, unfortunately, which is alienate the very people they're trying to educate. He recognizes and values each individual that he's worked with. He sees the individuality. He sees the humanity in every single person that he meets. He becomes them. He gets inside their head and he cares deeply for every person he's worked with. But He's also an academic. He's also a professor. So he, for many years, was the bridge between these two worlds where diehard academics needed regimented structure and authority. He, he laughed in the face of that and said, no, you need compassion. You need humanity. You need to reach out to the individual. And this, to me, has been my biggest, my biggest focus as a teacher, as an art teacher online, that every person I sit down with is somebody that I need to know. This is not somebody that I need to spew information at. This is somebody I need to know on an individual basis. And everybody has a very rich and very important story to tell. And as an educator, as Sir Ken Robinson was, he moved and impacted the lives of almost every person he met because he saw them and recognized them first, regardless of their, where they were from 
or their background or their age or their experience. He saw everybody for their value. And I value him for that greatly. Most importantly, he was an advocate for creative thinking, for creative expression, acting, painting, music, dance, etc. That which I am deeply involved in, in every facet of that. But what I love about the way he communicated it is how he demonstrates, he explains in great rich detail in his books and in his talks, the imperative inclusion of creativity. I was raised in an educational system that completely belittled artistic education. I remember when I was back in high school, when budgets were cut, they would hold on to sewing class, but they would cancel art class. And that to me was a crime against humanity. It was blasphemy. And, but they, it happened all the time. The first thing to get cut was drama class. The first thing to get cut was, was painting class or drawing. The only class that I ever had any form of, ever felt personally connected to. The teachers that I had, the few teachers that I had throughout my entire educational experience through high school and college and university were always the ones who had a direct connection to the creative arts because the creative arts are a direct connection to a human's soul. And if you can't recognize the humanity in what you do, you don't belong. And the fact that he could advocate for that, the fact that he could advocate so effectively, and the fact that he had such a balanced attitude about it to me was something that I just, as a person and as a professional, really can't value enough. And I'm very excited to see how his daughter, Kate, carries that torch and helps to push that influence moving forward because that's where the world needs to go educationally or, or it's not going to go well. So yes, so Kate and to Ken, if you're listening, thank you. The second on my list is incidentally somebody who's also hosted one of the most popular TED Talks of all time, Benjamin Zander, who in a space of only 20 or 30 minutes, I can't remember the exact length of the length of his TED Talk, took a room full of corporate heads looking for some self-help guides and had them all in tears at the end of his talk because he's a music teacher and more important than teaching the technicalities of music he taught how to love it his goal was not to teach people a song his goal was to teach people how to cry to that song, how to feel from that song. And he succeeded. But he didn't succeed by playing the song beautifully. He didn't su succeed by, by moving his body or, or dramatizing in a certain way that, that made people feel emotionally connected to him. No. He took his audience through the journey of learning the technicalities of art, of music in his case, one note at a time, one impulse, as he called it, and how that became a quarter note and a half note and a whole note and how he took that into measures and expanded across the song until eventually the entire song became one artistic, emotional expression. And when he played that last note, there wasn't a dry eye in that entire audience. And what you realize in the end is that you can teach, you can teach highly technical things without having to focus on the technical specifically. Because if that's all you do, then all you're teaching people to do is to repeat, to regurgitate, rather than to feel and to understand the value. Where are you going with this lesson? Where are you going with this information? Are you just trying to show off that you can play these notes quick and clean? Or are you teaching somebody how to turn sound into feeling? He didn't teach his audience how to play music. He taught them how to cry. 
He taught them how to feel. He taught the value of artistic expression. He gave us a reason to fight for it, to raise the standard of appreciation for this art form. But that all starts with the heart. And that's why my heart goes out to you, Benjamin Zander. The next person on my list has probably been my longest term influence because it started back when I was in high school. When I was really young, a young kid, I used to play a lot of sports, hockey and soccer and stuff like that. But at a certain age, it wasn't just fun and energetic. It became competitive and it became very jockey. And that's when I kind of lost taste in it. It wasn't my thing. But I still loved being physically active. And um, just being physically active for the sake of it wasn't enough for me. I needed a creative outlet at the same time. So it should come as no surprise that I ended up really falling in love with skateboarding. And back in high school, there was a big surge of skateboarding. It became a very popular thing. And one group in particular that was probably the most popular at the time was Paul Peralta. And I skated a lot of Paul Peralta. I started off with, I think I started off with a Tony Hawk. But then because I didn't skate vert that much, I ended up skating Lance Mountain. And then I got a, then I got a Mike McGill. But then I got a Rodney Mullen. Now, of course, the board itself, the deck itself is irrelevant. It's the person, Rodney Mullen. And Rodney Mullen has an incredible story that, <clears throat> drum roll please, he ended up doing a TED Talk about <laughs> many years later. Um, but uh, to go back, Rodney Mullen was somebody who really, in many ways, was instrumental in writing the vocabulary of skateboarding, particularly street and freestyle skating. And he pretty much invented the ollie, which is the literally the foundation. It's the core of the majority of skate moves nowadays to this day, along with an endless list of different moves and different variations that he creatively made over the years. But at the beginning of his career, he lived a life that a lot of us artists can very much relate to, myself not because I was, I was raised by an artist who very much supported it. But he was raised by a, by a dad who did not see the value in what he did. He was a practical father, like a lot of our parents are. They're, they're practical. They want us to be safe. They want us to, uh, they want us to be secure. They want us to be able to support ourselves and our families. So I wouldn't hold it against Rodney's dad, but he told him, you can do it for now. You can fiddle around with your skateboard now, but once you reach a certain age, it's time to hang up your skateboard and start doing the real thing. And Rodney was prepared for that. But because he had this finite amount of time and because he had this, this fiery passion for skateboarding, he improved extremely fast, but also had an incredible gift, a gift that even watching him to this day, I watch videos of his the moves he's created and the videos he's done over the years. And to this day, it just boggles the mind what he pulled off technically and creatively. And a skater that I watch all the time is Geiger. And Geiger, is, he's like a huge fan of Rodney Mullen's moves. And he has a series where he tries to pull off one of Rodney Mullen's moves. And he goes over the move hundreds and thousands of times adjusting his body and adjusting the situation and adjusting the set just so he can pull off this move time after time after time and you go holy shit Rodney Mail looks so easy but all of that innovation and all of that all of that skill well for starters it did grant him his father's graces and his father said okay fine if you're on magazines and you're making a living off of this I guess I can leave you alone about it so there was a first achievement by him that was a very big deal but more importantly, later on in his life, all of that falling, all of that abuse that he put on his body really started to show itself. And his hips completely grounded down to nothingness where he could barely move his legs. And that is, that is a future in a wheelchair it, <laughs> at best, right? And they basically told him, you're not going to be skating for long. And if you keep doing this, it's game over for you. Um, no, I'm not advocating for necessarily doing what he did, but it's ex extremely painful and potentially extremely damaging to his body. But he rehabilitated himself through his own pain. He overcame unimaginable pain 
two hip joints that were completely filed down to nothing. And he managed to grind through all the tendons and muscles in very unorthodox ways until eventually he could get back on a skateboard and he could start doing moves again. He could start skating again. He could start innovating again. And now he's a guy, he's older than me. I think he's in his 50s at this point. And he skateboarded onto a TED stage and gave a speech. And what, what blew me away, not only back then, but more so now as an adult who's approaching 50 himself, um, looking, him, looking at him get up on stage, still acting like he's a 16-year-old, <laughs> telling his story in an incredibly heartwarming and compassionate way. He's a very easy man to love, big time. Um, share his story of how he overcame every adversity through his entire life. And he was literally given kind of the worst case scenarios on every shape, on every side of the table. He overcame that because of something he believed in. He overcame it because he was deeply connected to himself, his body, his mind, his desires. And as a result of that, moved everybody. As a result of that, showed that you don't need to wear a shirt and a suit and tie and drive a Lamborghini and be a, a loudmouth douchebag to garner respect. You can be a soft-spoken, introverted country boy with a goofy laugh and crooked teeth and, you know, looking like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo and, and create waves throughout the world that are that will blind out the sun and for that reason as an adult as somebody who looks at himself who goes who's gone through his own little his own little physical challenges he keeps me strong he keeps me focus focused and he reminds me that if you focus on what matters most if you focus on your passion if you focus on 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 your expression then everything else around you will naturally fall into place if you let it. So to Rodney, thank you. I would argue that the next person on my list is the biggest influence to me at the most foundational level and is the embodiment of, um, of the most important value that I hold so much so that I wrote it on my skin. I tattooed it on my arm. And that is the knowledge of self and embracing your true self. I really believe that this is the foundation for the greatest greatness that any person has to offer and the greatest sense of strength and comfort and compassion for oneself. And the individual I'm talking about is Abigail Thorne, who did not start her life as Abigail Thorne. She started as somebody else, somebody who disguised herself in a man's body from birth onwards. And then at a certain point in her life, being a very big influence, being a respected mind and philosopher, um, came out. And finally, after many years of holding it back, finally came out and presented her on stage in her very beautiful, dramatic way in her true form and I respect what she did and I and I admire her for what she did I admire her for her strength she overcame incredible fear she stood up in front of the opposing army doing so she took her shield and sword and stood up in front of them but what influences me the most by her what I what I what I value in her the most and what I look at is not so much what she's done it's who she is and who she became once she came out and if you know Abigail before she was Abigail and then after you'll see that once she allowed herself to express herself fully unapologetically and presented herself in her beautiful and glamorous way that she came alive 
that it's like that there was this fire that was lit inside of her charm, her humor, her insight, her compassion, her diplomacy. All of these qualities were amplified tenfold once she expressed it through the body and the face and the mind and the voice that was the most authentic to her. And she is literally the physical embodiment of integrity. And that is why I love listening to her. That's why I love following her. And and I think one of the things that I found particularly impressive by her was how she addressed the very negative and very controversial judgment by not only society in general, but by that very popular, very polarizing Canadian philosopher whose initials are JP, who I won't say. But um, but she approached somebody who very academically and very condescendingly um, diminished her existence. I mean, we're not just talking about We're not just talking about who she's playing. We're not just talking about who she's acting like. This isn't acting. This is her identity. This is her humanity, the core of who she is as a human being. There is nothing more fundamentally important to that. And he challenged not only her existence, but the existence of anybody who's a member of the trans community. And um, she did so compassionately that she channeled the judgment and the challenges that she's faced throughout her life hiding her identity and finally coming out and sharing her identity and she channeled the hate and anger that she's and the judgment that she's received throughout her throughout her entire life into an act of compassion towards him that she didn't just turn him down and call him names that she She sat next to him and helped to sway the waves of his dialogue and his philosophy and his thoughts in it gently in a different direction by using her inertia to move his. And it it was an act of genius. It's an act of humanity. It was an act of brilliance. And I've witnessed this time and time again with my own students. I have many students that I've had over the years who are members of the trans community, trans men, trans women, non-binary, and I can say with absolute confidence that they're some of the most vibrant, moving, and influential and beautiful people I've ever met. Most beautiful men and women I've ever met in my entire life because they fought their entire lives to own their identity the way they chose to. And when that identity is found, it is forged so deep that it is breathtaking. The last on my list is going to surprise you the most (laughs) because, well, technically he's not human. He's not human. He's an animated character. And... You're probably going to think, oh my God, Adam actually knows this character. And half of you might not even know who he is. Although nowadays most people do. But he's been a big influence to me, not because of who he is, because technically he is not. He's he's the manifestation of writers and artists. But the character that he plays, the personality that he presents, I feel is a personality and an attitude that I see in the people I admire most and I feel is a very big influence in the decisions that I make day after day that much like Abigail and much like all of the other people on this list that I've mentioned today has an ability to hold true to himself and that is Victor. Who's Victor? (laughs) <laughs> Some of you might be shocked by hearing that because you already know who Victor is. Victor is the figure skating coach in Yuri on Ice, uh, an animated film that my daughter exposed me to because I'm not a, I'm not an official weeb just yet. I'm working on it. I'm, you know, like, like 
my daughter Emily and her boyfriend are like ridiculously hardcore weebs that follow everything. Uh, I Emily is my she's my consultant when it comes to anime. But one of the animes that I fell in love with deeply and she knew I would was Yuri on Ice. And it's a beautiful story. They've been apparently working on a film for years. But the reason why I really I really fell for the character of Victor in particular is because of how he how he could maintain his composure in the face of so much chaos the chaos of the figure skating world the the chaos of dealing with young aspiring professional figure skaters and he takes on these two two skaters in particular yuri and i keep forgetting the please let me know in the comments below the, the the Russian the Russian figure skater who's got a who has anger management issues because you know in every anime you've always got to have at least one character that has severe anger management issues right but throughout all of this he maintains this air of acceptance and if I could if I could summarize his personality and his interactions and how he speaks and looks at people and how he reacts to these heightened emotions of humiliation or anger or or fury or competitiveness or bureaucracy it's unconditional love he sees people losing their losing their minds angry jealous vindictive and he smiles gently and diplomatically and he always brings them back to him and it's through his gentleness, it's through his calm, it's through his composure, it's through his demure personality that he he very he he's always the most grounded and he pulls everybody back into his energy because ultimately what he's trying to create are young professionals who are in control of what it is that they produce, that they are fully emotionally and artistically and creatively connected to what it is that they're doing and they did that they don't let their emotions get the better of them that they have to mature and um, get control of their own emotional selves which is at the foundation of every individual on this planet and at the foundation especially of every artist on this planet and if i was to add another person onto this list that falls into exactly that same category that would be dolly parton somebody who was somebody my mom listened to and you know she was she was a bit older at the time so she wasn't somebody i i followed personally but um has always represented to me and later on a viral clip ended up coming out not too long ago of her being interviewed by barbara walters who um was exposed for being the judgmental conservative douchebag that she is <laughs> who sat down with a very very decorated and very flamboyant and very soft um feminine dolly parton who with her big teased hair and her big looks and dresses and asked her very rhetorical and very insulting questions um in, in a way to very gently and very calmly insult the crap out of her and through that entire process dolly smiles and she she maintains her calm and she shows compassion and understanding for Barbara's questions. And in every single situation, no matter how intensely Barbara tries to corner her, Dolly gently moves her out of the way and continues forward with her thoughts. She never lets Barbara control her decisions. And the same goes for Victor. He's, a, he's the embodiment of the power of choice. I made an art talk years ago, or not years ago necessarily, but a while ago, where I spoke about that the value of that very thing. No matter what life throws at you, no matter what physical or emotional or psychological or any other kind of challenge or hurt you might endure in your life, even if you've hit absolute rock bottom, when you've got nothing left. You've always got one thing left. And when you hit rock bottom, when there's nothing left, 
you realize the value of this one thing. And that, that one thing is choice. You always have the choice of what you're going to do next. And nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can take your choices away from you at all. And that's what they present. So, Ken Robinson, Benjamin Zander, Rodney Mullen, Abigail Thorne, and Victor slash Dully. Thank you for being huge influences in my life. And if you listening right now want to feel better about yourselves, if you're if you feel that you are lacking strengths and focus and energy and you don't know exactly what you're going to do next, I recommend you surround yourself with people of quality, just like the ones that I've mentioned. And I pretty much guarantee you that you're going to realize that you're going to be just fine. All right. With that said, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care. Thank you.